let's, let's pray before we open God's word. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we're about to open your word. Your word is powerful, Lord. You created everything around us with your word. And you have the power, Lord, to change our lives through your word. And we ask that the Holy Spirit take your word this morning and open our eyes, convince us of sin, convict us of sin, and convert us from sin. Liberate us with your truth is our prayer this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the title of the sermon this morning is Modern Idolatry. Modern Idolatry. Everybody knows what idolatry is? I assume, idol worship, worshiping idols, uh, bowing down to images, uh, whatever else you can call it. I I don't have a lot of synonyms for it. Um, But that's what we're going to study about this morning. Um, You might not see, we're not talking about idolatry in its uh, old form. You know, it still exists in the world. There's still a lot of people who bow down to images and uh, they have an image of what they call a god or a deity and they, you know, offer up offerings to it and bow down to it and worship it and ask, make petitions to it. That still exists in the world today. I I don't want to talk about that. Uh, I'm more concerned about modern idolatry and what that is you know, to us today. Uh, there's a quote from, um, from the book Prophets and Kings, and it's the chapter that talks about um, right after Mount Oreb and everything, and Elijah is fleeing for his life. Jezebel has threatened him. And uh, it says this, The world today has its Ahabs and its Jezebels. The present age is one of idolatry. As ver- verily as was that in which Elijah lived. No outward shrine may be visible. There may be no image for the eye to rest upon. Yet thousands are following after the gods of this world. After riches, fame, pleasure, and the pleasing fables that permit man to follow the inclinations of the unregenerate heart. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and his attributes and are as truly serving a false god as were the worshipers of Baal. Many, even those who claim to be Christians, have allied themselves with influences that are unalterably opposed to God and his truth. Thus they are led to turn away from the divine and to exalt the human. So, Do we have a problem with idolatry in our days as they did back in ancient Israel? We do. We do. My concern is that it's, 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 I think, scarier. It's more effective. It's it's, uh, more subtle. It's harder to point at. Um, You know, if we we had an image, I remember when I was growing up, uh, I don't mean to offend anybody in here if, if... they have this, these beliefs, but I remember in my uh, grandma's house, uh, before they became Seventh-day Adventist, you walked down the sidewalk, and at the end of the sidewalk, right bef- in front of the door, there was like a little concrete uh, pedestal, and on top of the pedestal, there was an image of the Virgin Mary. And uh, the same at my aunt's house, and almost all my relatives' house, they all had something. And, um, you know, I never remember when that happened, but... I didn't see it afterwards. Once we were Seventh-day Adventist, I, I, there was just the feet. And I think, I don't know if my grandma did it herself or ordered somebody to do it, but you just saw the feet there. Um, but I, I grew up, um, my grandma went to all, a lot of churches. I didn't know what I was when I was a little kid. Um, she went to, I remember going to spiritual spiritualist temples in uh, Reynosa, which was very, very weird. We would go in there, and uh, these people would stand up. 
from the side of the room, and they were mediums. And some spirit would come into them, and they would heal people, and they would do miraculous healings and stuff. And there was, you'd actually see it happen. There's people who came in with something, they left with nothing. And uh, you'd see this man sitting in the front, and he'd all of a sudden have the spirit of Benito Juarez in him, and he'd start talking, and his voice would change. It was kind of weird. And they wouldn't let you. I remember it was a very, very, like, poor little place. It looked like a ranch. And there was no backs to the benches. So I was a little kid, and I was really bored sometimes. I wanted to sleep, and they'd pinch you, and they didn't let you. And they wouldn't let you cross your arms. They wouldn't let you cross your legs. You had to be like this, like, really attentive. Anyway, so it was that, Catholicism, and a mix of everything that, I grew up seeing, so if you would have asked me back then what we were, I couldn't give you a straight answer. And surprisingly, in these places, they had, um, they were supposedly Christian. They would have crucifixes in there, they would have, um, you know, pictures of, of saints and stuff, but it was spiritualism. It was very, very confusing. And um, that's happening in our world today and it's infiltrated Christianity, where there's a mix of idolatry with Christianity. And you say, well, how and why? Um, there's a strategy that Satan uses. And usually Satan doesn't change his strategies because they work. And he's, been, he's, been, he's the ultimate psychologist. He's been studying humanity for 6,000 years. So he knows us very well. He knows what works, and he uses his strategies over and over again. That's why in the Bible you read uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, that those things that happen in older lessons for us that have reached the end times. Because even though it happened way back then, it can still happen to us today. And um, Satan did something. If you, if you go to num Numbers chapter, uh, chapter 24 with me, Numbers chapter 24, you find a very interesting story there. Numbers chapter 24. And uh, do you guys know that this, this is the story of Balaam? Have you, are you guys familiar? Everybody familiar with the story of Balaam? For those who aren't familiar, a brief summary. So Israel, God took Israel out of slavery, out of Egypt... He sent plagues, and he decimated the Egyptians. He opened up the Red Sea, and the Red Sea swallowed them up, swallowed the whole army of the Egyptians. The people of Israel were saved miraculously, but they didn't believe God could put them into the promised land, and they didn't want to go, and they tried to stone uh, Moses and Aaron and Joshua, and they basically cursed themselves, and they said, no, we'd rather die in the desert, and God said, okay, I'm going to let your words come true. So 40 years, you're going to be walking in the desert. And in those 40 years, only your sons and daughters that you said were going to be captive to your enemies, they're the ones that are going to the promised land. You're not going to the promised land. Okay. So those 40 years are about to be up. And they're already in the border of the promised land. And they have already had a couple of battles with some, um, some pagan kings. And, and they defeated the pagan kings. And now... They're at the border of Moab, and all of a sudden, imagine if you were the people of Moab, and all of a sudden you wake up one morning, and you look out, and you see thousands of tents, and hundreds of thousands of people camped right by your property. And then you hear, you've heard about these people, that they have this powerful God that destroyed the most powerful nation of their times, and has just defeated two other kingdoms, and they're on their way to take over your land. How would you feel? You'd be worried, right? You'd be scared. So Moab comes up with a plan and says, you know what? And he understands it's not, it's not normal conventional warfare. There's something different about these people. This is spiritual warfare. So he goes... And he contracts somebody, he pays somebody to come and curse the people of God. And that's Balaam. Balaam was supposed to be a prophet of Jehovah, a prophet of the true God. 
And he goes and he bribes Balaam, offers him money to come and curse the people. And there's a story there where, you know, God confronts him when he's on his way. He asked God twice if he could go with him. He had already been told once, and he goes and he asks, and God said, you know what, go ahead. And then he stops him on the way over there and says, you better speak whatever I tell you. These are my people. And he says, okay, okay, okay. You know, and the donkey talked to him and all that. All right. So this man, Balaam, is there, and he warns the king that contracted him and all those people, I can only say what God puts in my mouth when I go, when I go up there. So he goes and he sacrifices some animals, and then every time he would try to curse the people of God, blessings would come out. Isn't that beautiful? Every time he was going to curse the people of God, blessings would come out. And now I'm going to read to you some of those blessings. And I'm reading from chapter 24, verse 8. God brings him out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. He shall consume the nations, his enemies. He shall break their bones and pierce them with his arrows. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? Blessed is he who blesses you, and cursed is he who curses you. Isn't that amazing? And then look at this one. Behold, I have received the command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He has not observed iniquity, nor has... I'm sorry, I'm reading from chapter 23, verse 21. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord, his God, is with him. And the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. Again, the same thing. For there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, Oh, what God has done. Did you catch that? There's no sorcery. And there's no divination against Israel. So there was no external spiritual power or warfare or witchcraft or anything that they could do or curse that could befall the people of God because it said there that God observed no sin in his people and God was with them. Did you, did you catch that? All right. So, and the last one, it says, blessed are those that, that bless you and cursed, cursed are those that curse you. And that's when that king goes, hey, wait, 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 wait. I hired you to curse him. And you've blessed him already three times. That's it. He says, I was going to give you money, but you just, you just talked yourself out of it. And, and he doesn't get anything. But where am I going to? There's a, there's a point to this. Nothing external can hurt a son or daughter of God when they're walking with their God. Nothing from the outside. No matter how strong Satan is, he trembles at the humblest of God's children that are in communion with him. But the story changes. In chapter 25, we see something different happen. There's a, there's a story of ba Baal Peor. I don't know how to pronounce that in, in English. Baal of Peor. Is it Peor? Peor. Okay. So he couldn't get them like that. All of a sudden, they're camped out, and there's this nice, you know, big old grove. There's trees and everything. It's a nice area. They weren't used to this. They, they were used to desert life. And everything's calm. Moses and the elders are really busy right now with how the land's going to be um, divided amongst the tribes. And all of a sudden, uh, unbeknownst to, to Moses and them, uh, the Moabite women start coming into the camp. And they start, you know, making friends with them. And they're very friendly, very nice people. They seem like the best neighbors. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with them. Maybe at first the, the Israelites were, hey, who are they? But no, oh, hey, hey, I brought you some food. You guys are hungry? Look, I cooked this. And, oh, oh man, this is delicious. Hey, where, where are you guys from? And, you know, they start chatting and they made friends. And, uh, Later, that friendship turns into something else. It turns into a curse. They start fornicating with the people. And uh, 
cause them to sin, they invite them to their, to their festivities at Baal Peor, and they have these big banquets, and they feast, and then they bow down to their idols, and they had sex, which was a very common thing in their worship of Baal. And all of a sudden, God starts sending a plague amongst his people. And I think, if the number's correct, about 23 or 25,000 of them died, which, coincidentally, was the last people that had to die before they went into the promised land. So they had almost made it, and they probably thought, hey, whew, you know, the land's right there. We're almost in. Oh, God, thank you. Forty years are almost up. You know, I, I didn't die in the desert. And all of a sudden, boom, you know, God's prophecy came true. These people fell. Why did they fall? What happened? Why is it that a powerful man couldn't curse them, but all of a sudden, God has to destroy them? Yeah. Satan's strategy. It wasn't coincidental. You can read further on, and, and it shows uh, when um, they go to make war. And this is something very interesting. These, these were the, the, the Madianites and, uh, and the Moabites. But there's something very, very interesting about this. The Malachites, if you, you guys remember who the Malachites were, right? If, if you study the Bible, the Malachites were the first to attack Israel when they were in the desert. And they attacked him from the rear, you know, not, which was not the, the regular custom for warfare back then. And they attacked the, the young children and everything. And God said, one day I'm going to wipe them out completely. And then later, generations later, Saul was tasked with going and wiping them out. Remember that story? All right. But these guys, God said, we need to take care of this immediately. Moses reacted immediately. He sent, he sent out armies to go and to destroy these people who had made the, pe the, the, the people sin. And they came back, and they brought women, and he says, why did you let the women survive? He says, don't you know that Balaam, uh, as following Balaam's counsel, these people led, led, uh, are, are meant to fornicate and to idols. So that's the point. Balaam couldn't curse them, but he goes and he advises the, the pagan king, if you want to get the people of God, you need to make them sin and fall into idolatry, and then God's not going to protect them anymore, and you can do whatever you want with them. And that is the strategy that Satan used over and over and over and over with the people of Israel back in the Old Testament. You can read story after story. I, I'm not going to read you every little story because I did this the other day when I was preaching and it turned out really, really long. I was at a Spanish church. They don't mind long sermons, but we're not going to do that today. But just give you some examples. Gideon. You remember Gideon? All right. Story of Gideon. God liberates them from the, the Madianites. And they had been oppressed by them. Every time people would fall into idolatry, they didn't have God's protection. And one of these uh, pagan nations would come and they would have them oppressed. And the time of Gideon, the Midianites were the ones that were doing this. And they'd come every time it was harvest time, they would, they would come and whoop, they would take all their food. And they had them in extreme poverty. And they were miserable, and it, once they were tired of this, they would cry out to God, and they would repent, and God would, would send somebody to liberate them. And this is the story of Gideon. Gideon, God orders him in Judges chapter 6, verse 25 and verse 28. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. Judges chapter 6, verse 20. 5 and 28. And it says, Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, 
Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the wooden image that is beside it. And then verse 28. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, there was the altar of Baal torn down and the wooden image that was beside it was cut down and the second bull was being offered on the altar which had been built. So Gideon is the liberator, God, the, the man that God asked to go and do this big miracle. He goes in and frees the people of Israel with 300 men. You remember that story, right? Before he does anything, though, he says, go into your father's house and tear down the idols. There was idols inside the father's house. He goes and he does that. Um, Hefte, how do you pronounce that in Spanish? Uh, Jephthah. Is that correct? Jephthah? In Judges chapter 11, we're not going to look into the story, but Jephthah, same thing. They're being oppressed now by another group of, of people, and God instructs them, hey, take away your idols. They go and they take away their idols, and you can find that in Judges chapter 10, verse 11 and 16. And then God lifts up uh, Jephthah, and he goes and he liberates the people. Hezekiah, in, in uh, 2 Kings, he is a king that, fear, he, that fears God, and he tears down the idols and takes the idols from the temple and from all these places that his father had. And Sennacherib comes, the, the king of uh, Syria, and he's threatening him. He's wiped out Israel. He's wiped out all those people. And now he's going after Judah and Jerusalem. And because this king had done all that, he prays to God, and God sends one angel and wipes out, I think it was 186,000 soldiers in one night. But in all these cases, what I want you to see, Jacob, when he, his sons Levi and Simeon, they went and they killed the people of Sichem. You remember that? The... the the people, the son there had raped uh, Dina, Dina, right? Had raped her, and then he wanted to marry her, and then they said, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll let you marry her, but you need to get circumcised. And then the, when they were in their greatest pain in the third day, Levi and Simeon, two brothers, went and they wiped out the, all the men from that town. And uh, Jacob was so scared, he said, oh, you've made us a, a, an abomination to all the people around us. And I have very few men. They're going to come and wipe us out. But then God speaks to Jacob and says, come to Bethel, the first place where I appear to you. And like God's reminding him, hey, remember I said I was going to be with you? Doesn't mean I'm with you only in the good. I'm with you always. And then, but before he goes, he instructs his own family to put away the idols. And they all give, his own family had idols. Remember, uh, uh, what's her name? Rachel? And stole her, her father's idols and, and was hitting, hiding them under the camel. So in God's people, idols. In his, in his family, in his chosen family, Jacob, they had idols. And we see this strategy over and over again. And is it happening in our day today? Has Satan put idols in our lives? Ezekiel chapter 14 God is talking to Ezekiel. The elders of Israel have come to consult him. And they're saying, Now some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me, and the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired at all by them? So the elders of Israel, the ones that were supposed to be the spiritual leaders, they're in captivity now. These guys are over by, uh, I forget the name of the river, where, where Ezekiel was. They weren't in Babylon. Daniel was in Babylon. Ezekiel was over here with these people. And uh, they come and they're telling this to, they want to consult Jehovah. But they, God says they have idols in their hearts. So it wasn't that they were carrying a wooden image or a gold image and they were bowing down to it. It says the idols are in their hearts and that's where our idols are in our days. There's something else that was very uh, weird to read and fascinating. Do you guys know who the Samaritans were? 
in the Bible, we read the Samaritans, and we usually sometimes associate it with something positive. We think about the good Samaritan. But the Samaritans, you know, there was a reason the, the people, the, the Jewish people didn't like them. Um, the Assyrians had wiped out Israel and carried the tribes away and scattered them all over the world, right? And then he, he, uh, he brought people from Babylon and from all these other little countries that he had conquered from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharvaim, I, I don't know how to, Sepharvaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they took possession of the land, and then something started happening. That they st Lions started to come and attack them. So in their mind, they said, you know what? This is hap happening because of this. Look, we'll look what verse 26 says. So they spoke to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations whom you have removed and placed in the cities of Samaria do not know the rituals of the God of the land. Therefore, he has sent lions, lions among them, and indeed, they are killing them because they do not know the rituals of the God of the land. So the king of Assyria commanded them, saying, send, send there one of the priests whom you brought from there. Let him go and dwell there and let him teach them the rituals of the king of the God of the land. And they sent a, a Levite over there, a priest. And he was supposedly teaching them how to fear Jehovah. But read, look, look at this, verse 29. However, every nation con continued to make gods of its own and put them in the shrines on the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation in the cities where they dwelt. Verse 33. They feared the Lord, yet served their own gods according to the rituals of the nations from among whom they were carried away. Verse 41. So these nations feared the Lord, yet served their carved images. Also their children and their children's children have continued doing as their fathers did even to this day. So to the, to the Jewish people, it was an abomination of the Samaritans. They hated the Samaritans because they were a mix of the, the Jewish faith with paganism. It was a mix. Did you notice there it said they feared God, but they served their own gods? How does that happen? Notice there was a word that was repeated over and over again. Teach them their rituals. Teach them their rituals. Teach them their rituals. Did you catch that? So there's something happening with the, the way an, uh, uh, an idolatrous person looks at God is very different than what God wants to be looked at. You know, in Daniel chapter 5, verse 23... When Daniel is before uh, Belsasar, there's a handwriting on the wall. Remember that story? And he's, the guy's trembling. He had brought out the cups from the temple of God. And then a hand appeared and wrote, Mene, mene, teke luparsin, on the wall. And uh, nobody could understand it. They bring out Daniel. And Daniel says, okay, po, 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 po. And one of the things Daniel says, all these have, you remember your your father, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he was proud and everything, and God had to humble him, and he was cast out for seven years, and he was like a beast. And you knew all these things, and you didn't humble yourself. He says, but you've worshipped the gods of stone, the gods of wood, the gods of gold, the gods of silver, but the God in whose your life, in whose, whose hand your life is in, you have never honored you see, there's a, a problem, the, the problem with idolatry or the attitude behind idolatry is this. They want a God they can use. A God they can appease to get their own way. A God you do transactions with. You bring him something, he gives you something. I'll burn incense for you. I'll do this. I'll do that. And they were saying all these bad things are happening. The lions are eating these people because they don't know the rituals of the God of that land. The truth is they didn't know the God of that land, not the rituals. And in our days, we fall into being ritualistic too. 
We fall into these religious routines where we come to church we, once a week or twice a week or three times a week, and we sit there and we listen to a sermon, we sing some songs, but we're doing our own thing anyway. It's the same as an idolatrous person going to a shrine, bowing down, giving an offering, and then asking for things. And we come to church and we say, oh, I want God to bless me. And we pretend to worship that God, but we don't know that God. We have no relationship with that God. And that's exactly what Satan wants. You know, when sin entered the world, it caused a terrible pain in the heart of God. He was separated from his children that he so much loved. And from that day on, I don't know, it's almost 6,000 years since Adam and Eve. Do you know how much pain the Father has suffered watching us? The Bible says that he cares for the sparrow that falls. Do you know how many animals... How many people, how many babies, how many people have died and suffered, separated from God? And he loves every one of them. All the pain, all this sin has caused. What is God looking for? God is not blind. You see a God of stone, a God of wood, a God of gold, a God of silver. Money, cars, fame, popularity, whatever you want. Now, sometimes we're our own idols. Characteristics of an idol is it's blind. It doesn't hear. It does nothing. God is the opposite. God sees everything that's happening with you, and he hears everything, and he feels everything that's going on with you and me. And he cares about everything. And Satan's put in our minds, hey, you know what? Let's have this separation. Let's have some boundaries here, okay? Uh, you're in my comfort zone, God. I'd rather, you know, when I need you, I'll come to you and I'll ask you for something. You give it to me. And, you know, I'll do what you want. But when I'm not in agreement, you know what? Let's just agree to disagree and let's keep some distance and let's, let's be nice and civil to each other. But, you know, I'm going to do it my way. I heard somewhere, um, I heard somewhere, and I don't know if this is true. Uh, I'm not going to try to cooperate it, but I heard that, Satanist people, Satan worshipers, that their hymn, that one of their favorite hymns is I Did It My Way by Frank Sinatra. You know? She went, mm-hmm. And I'm like, how do you know, sister? But Satan doesn't care who or what you worship or bow down to as long as, as it's if it, as it's not the one true God, the creator. Your creator, my creator. That's why God, in Ezekiel, he, he talks about Sabbaths being a sign between his people and him. And, and, him. and uh, says, hollow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And there's another verse there that says that I am the Lord your God that sanctifies them. I'm sorry, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Yet the house of Israel, of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes, they despise my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they greatly defiled my Sabbaths. Then I said I would pour out my fury on them in the wilderness to consume them. And um, if you keep reading, it says that they, in verse 16, because they despise my judgments and did not walk in my statutes, but profane my Sabbaths for their heart when after their idols. You know, I was talking about Satan doing this. Remember when God speaks the Ten Commandments to Israel in Mount Sinai? Remember that? 
they heard the Ten Commandments. At the end, God says, don't bow down to images and don't do this, don't, don't do images of gold. Somebody was listening. Satan was there. I, I imagine him shaking in his boots when he sees you know, God descend about on Mount Sinai and with all this glory and everything. But he heard them, and he says, I know what I'll do. And you find in Exodus chapter 31 the story of them in the presence of God making up a golden calf and bowing down to it and saying, these are the gods that took us out of Egypt. And Satan's purpose with that was, you know what? I can't forcefully take them out of the hand of God. I can't hurt them when God has them surrounded. Remember the story of Job? When Satan says, you have him encircled and you have him blessed. You have a hedge around him and everything that he owns. Take it away and see if he doesn't curse you. So Satan knows he can't touch you when you've surrendered yourself to God and you're walking with him. So his strategy is, you know what? I'm going to make him rebel against God. I'm going to make him bow down to everything. I'm going to make him separate from God. So he's got God's protection no more, and he's my prey. So why am I talking about this this morning, this Sabbath? How many of us want a closer walk with God? Amen. Amen. We read these stories in the Bible, and we see miracles happening. Sometimes we'll listen to a pastor preaching, and we'll hear miraculous things going and testimonies. Oh, man, this person, this, this happened in this person's life. And, and we get excited. Sometimes we, we even cry and says, oh, my God, you know, we're impressed by how God's working in other people's lives. How many of you are tired of seeing God do miracles in other people's lives and not seeing them in your own? I am. And I've been praying to God about it and said, you know what, God? I want to be all in with you. I'm tired of holding back even one bit. You see, the way we walk with God in, in, in it says, the, I'm the, your Lord that sanctifies you, is he takes you by the hand and says, he's, you, you've come, okay, you, I want to walk with you, God. I want to give you my life, my heart, Jesus, my Savior. Okay, well, okay walk with me. And he starts walking you in the path of, of life. And we get to a certain point where we have to let go of stuff. You know, we have, we're holding on to an idol. We're holding on to a sin. We're holding on to something that's hurting us, that's, ha that's separating us from God. And God says, you need to let that go. You need to put that down. And then we have a choice if we do it or we don't. If we do, if we listen to God, if we submit to God, if we surrender to God's will, then we continue in that path of growth with God. And our characters are being changed to his, to his glory, to his likening. But it only happens if you agree and if you want it, if you decide it. The moment you say no, it stops right there. And that's where you where you've ended up. And a lot of us came to Christ one day and gave our hearts to him and gave our lives to him. The Holy Spirit touched us and we said yes and we went through the baptismal waters. But we're not at the promised land yet. Are we of those people that are going to die in the desert because we've preferred to hold on to idols and to false gods and to worship other things, other concepts, other ideas, ourself, be it pride, be it lust, be it the love of the world, be it vanity, whatever you want to call it, put whatever label you want on it. Are you going to want to be one of those that fell in the desert during those 40 years? Or do you want God to do wonderful and miraculous things in your life like he did with Joshua, Caleb, and the, that generation of people who remain faithful to God? In Ezekiel chapter 14, when the elders came and, and he talks to them and says, you know, these guys have, I'm not going to talk to them. They have the, the, the nerve to come and consult me when they have idols in their hearts. 
And then later on, you're reading the chapter, and it says, whenever I send pestilence, whenever I send the sword, whenever I send fierce beasts, whenever I send famine, uh, if there were these three gentlemen among them, Noah, Daniel, and Job, I swear they, they wouldn't even, they, nobody would be saved except them. What was God doing in there? He was contrasting people who had idols in their hearts, and he gave us three examples of people who didn't have idols in their hearts. And that was Noah, Daniel, and Job. And these three gentlemen, Noah, Daniel, and Job, went through really difficult circumstances and remained faithful to God and had God first in their heart. Job didn't love money or possessions more than God. That was taken away, and he remained faithful to God. And it was proven to Satan and to the rest of the universe that he loved God for who God was. Daniel, as a young man with his friends in Babylon, under really, you know, he had every excuse you could ask for to not be faithful to God. He said, oh, I wanted to, God, but they were going to chop my head off. What good am I to you dead? You know, so I had to, you know, I had to bow down to the idol, pretend I was tying my shoelaces. Won't you rather have me live, God, and, and keep serving you? Noah lived among a generation that was so wicked, God had to wipe them out with a flood. And he remained faithful to God with his family. And God needs those kind of people today. God wants to do miracles in your life and in my life and through you to reach a world that so desperately needs him. But we're probably holding on to something that we don't want to let go. And, you know, I said, put whatever label on it, whatever it is. Do you want to keep living like that and be a person that knows the rituals of the God of the land? Or do you want to go and know the God of the land? There's a beautiful promise in Ezekiel. And we'll end with this. Ezekiel chapter 36. Verse 24, for I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Verse 25, I'm reading from Ezekiel 36, 25. It says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will deliver you from all your uncleanliness. I will call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon, upon you. So, Beautiful promise, right? God wants to do this with you and with me. And nowadays we might be sitting here and we, we don't know. I mean, we walk in those doors and we see each other and we look really nice in, in our nice clothes and, you know, we're good hygiene, most of us. And then, uh, and then uh, we don't know what's going on in our lives, in each other's lives, sadly, a lot of us. We, a lot of us, are oppressed like this, and Satan has us oppressed and, and stuck, and you can't grow, and year after year goes by, and you even become discouraged because you don't see any positive and real measurable changes in your life. You don't see your life changing other people's lives. You're not happy. You don't have peace. You don't feel fulfilled. You feel an emptiness, an emptiness and a void, but you're here in church every Sabbath. And you're probably reading your Bible every day and you're doing a lot of things. Ask yourself what you're bowing down to. Ask yourself what you're still holding on to and bringing here with you today.
know, I'm here at church, and I'm Seventh-day Adventist, and I have the truth, and they don't, and we turn around and we point at other people. Do you have a living relationship with God? John chapter 15 says, Jesus says, I am the, the vine, and you are the what? He who is with me, he who abides in me, carries much what, gives much, bears much what? Fruit. If you don't see a lot of fruit in your life, worry. That means something's disconnected. You're, you've disconnected from the vine. I'm talking to myself too here. But God is so, so wonderful. There's a verse here in Ezekiel and says, which one of you, if your wife left you and went and slept with somebody else, had another man, would welcome her back in? How many would you, of you would do that? He says, but I do it. You've been unfaithful to me. You've turned your back to me. You've betrayed me time after time after time. And I'm seeking you out. That's what God tells us. So brother and sister, wake up. Don't fall into Satan's traps. Don't let him, don't let Satan plant idols in your heart, in your life, so that he can keep you oppressed. If you want to live a free life in Jesus Christ, a life that bears much fruit to his glory and for the salvation of many, ask God to clean you from all your idols and all your filthy and send for him to fulfill this promise that we read here in Ezekiel 36. God bless his word this morning. God bless you.